All right. So, um, so you guys know that Stan and I are elders right now, for those that don't know, but most of you guys know. And, uh, and so Stan and I are together on everything. We meet, we're meeting regularly to discuss the future of the church and pray for the direction of the church. And so Stan came in 91, Deb and I visited in 94 and joined in 95, so we've been here a long time as well. I was much younger then. <laughs> but, uh, but hey, it's just, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of changes. Uh, thank you, Stan. I, uh, <laughs> Inwardly, I, inwardly I'm, I hope I'm looking great. <laughs> Outwardly, it's just life. Um, but know, know that we're, we're taking it serious. Pray with us because we want to know the direction of the church. We want to be open to anything that God has, but we want to be serious about what God wants to do. And we believe, I believe that God has kept me here so long and never let me leave years ago because he has a purpose and a plan for this specific body. And all the time, many times through the years, gosh, since 95, I thought I should leave and tried to leave. But God said no. And so he has a purpose and a reason for us being here. And we want to discover what that is and, uh, and have the right people on board. And so, um, so just pray with us and, uh, and, and let's uh, realize that we are God's plan for right now, right here. We are his plan. It's easy to say, but it's the truth if we believe it. Amen. Amen. Okay. Stan prayed. We're going to step out in faith. Amen. Start saying pray again. We'll just trust God. Amen. Because we will pray in the end. Because the worship team will come back up in the end. I have a song I want you to sing again. So do y'all remember a few weeks ago whenever Stan spoke the first Sunday after the new year? And what was the title of his message? More and more, so more in 24, but his original message he thought about doing was 2025, here we come, but he thought that would throw y'all off. Oh, I love it. It's been sticking because I thought about this. How many of us would like to go back at the beginning of 2023 and start over? What if God, okay, I know, okay, I know there's been some bad, bad things happen, good things and bad things, tragedies happen, and sometimes we don't want to relive stuff. But let's just leave all that aside and say, if just it's you spiritually could come back and invest more in Jesus for that year. So what we can do looking forward to this year is, hindsight's twenty twenty. You know, I remember one time, I told you all this, worn out years ago, that I used to mow a cemetery way back there. And one time I was looking at a, at a, at a tombstone, and I was looking at the grave marker of a, person born in the 1800s and died in the 1900s. And, and I was thinking about his life, about what he would do over again, knowing that well, if he could come back, he'd probably live his life. All, all of us would, right? Hindsight's twenty twenty. If we could just go back, we'd live a lot of things different. But this is a chance to look ahead to 2025 and go, how now are we going to live this year? So let's do so more. And I started to say, invest more, but how about ingest more? <laughs> For 2024, so that when 2025 comes, here we come. Amen? I mean, what could God not do through a people who just dedicate themselves to Him? Amen? Um, so, let's do that. Here's my thing this morning. So, Wednesday, I'd invited, Jody Rhodes used to go here and invited me over to his big small group he has in a church over in Oklahoma, and he wanted me to share on prayer, meaning a lot how God, you guys know my story, how when God re-rescued me, how it affected my entire family. And, uh, and so he wanted me to come over and share on prayer, and prayer is a worthy subject, correct? I mean, is everybody, is anybody here pray enough? I seen a hand one time raised over here years ago when Bart uh, did Sunday, not Bart, um, um, Bert Calhoun did Sunday school. He says, how many of you guys in here pray enough? A hand went up. <laughs> oh, wow, that's pretty bold. <laughs> but prayer, the subject of prayer and tackling prayer is sometimes daunting to people. Do you know that? It's sometimes overwhelming when you say, we're going to study prayer, or we want you to pray more. 
But instead, I thought about this. And I'm glad I didn't share this Wednesday. This past Wednesday, because the time is, it got canceled because of ice and snow. So it'll probably come up here in a couple of weeks. But I've kind of changed things. Because as I really thought about it and prayed about it, instead I'm going to talk about, this is the title of my message, Rebecca. <laughs> Fellowship with Jesus. That's what it's about. Fellowship with Jesus. If I can encourage fellowship with Jesus, all else will come from this. Psalms 32, 8 says, He will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. He will counsel you and watch over you. Amen. Corey Ten Boom said this Bible, I won't go into who she is, famous woman of God, been through a lot, ministered a lot, said that this Bible is our checkbook. When you become a believer in Jesus, it's handed to you. These promises are yours. He will instruct me and teach me in the way I should go. He will counsel me and watch over me if I turn that over to him. Correct? So if I can encourage fellowship with Jesus, all else will come from that. He will encourage you to pray. Out of your fellowship with Jesus comes everything else. Everything else you need in life. What you're looking for comes out of your fellowship with Jesus. All of your gifts, all the great things you're seeking, what you've got for ministry, all of the prayers, a prayer life, will just come out of your fellowship with Jesus. The more you get to know Jesus, the more you naturally bring your wants and needs and concerns and fears to Him, right? Do you have fellowship with Jesus? What kind of fellowship? What, what is your level of fellowship with Jesus? Why, if you don't, or if it's not enough, why not? Um, John 1, 12 says, you know, it, it, John starts out saying, Jesus came into the world, but his own, came to his own, but his own didn't receive him. Yet to all receive, the word of God says, yet to all who receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. You're immediately part of his family. The moment you say, yes, Lord, I don't care what any theological teaching, instruction, whatever, there's nothing to add to receiving Jesus. See, it's out of when you receive him, he'll bring all that other with him. There's not Jesus and. And you need to do this. When you receive him, it's a gift. If I give a gift to you, what do you do? Take it and open it. Unpack it. Yet to all receive him. So when you receive him, you become a child of God. And 1 John 3, 1 and 2 says, How great is the love the Father has lavished on us. We all know this. That we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. So when somebody says, why do we, you know, because we're raised in this world and because we're so influenced by this world, we're so, Alice Walton flew in over on my job site here this past year. That's the daughter of Sam Walton. She makes $52 million a day. Woo! Alice Walton flew in. Everybody just wants a glimpse of the helicopter. Oh, here's a child of God. Like I said before, do you think the angels have any desire to go sit in, in, in Alice Walton's helicopter? No. But the weakest vessel and the weakest child of God, the angels of God, Gabriel, longs to look into your relationship with God. Do you get it? Don't let the enemy lie to you. And don't neglect your fellowship with him. I've all heard, all heard the story of Abraham Lincoln, who people always wanted to go, at least this is how I heard it. It could be a different president, but this is how I heard it. That people wanted to go in and see the president. Well, you couldn't go in and see the president. <laughs> Try to go see the president. But there was a little boy who could just walk in and out of his office. Is this correct? Was it Abraham Lincoln's son? You could just walk in, and if you were connected to his son, you could just walk in there too. <laughs> that is, his sons would bring his friends in the office. 
That's pretty cool. You have the same access to God, the everlasting Father, through what Jesus did. You are a child of God. Therefore, out of that, I want to encourage you, your fellowship with Jesus. So I thought of this, too, because we've got to get in practical terms. What did it mean for Joel and Bethany, my two kids who are grown now, married, to be a children of Daryl? Okay. I love them, watched over them, provided for them. I foresaw their needs. This is so cool to me. I foresaw their needs. We as parents see the things they can't see. Little kids are just, it's just whatever's right here. Oh, I remember the glorious days when Joel and Bethany could be totally entertained within the fences of our yard. Those were awesome days. <laughs> now my grandson, he'd be totally entertained just as presence of his granddad. It's awesome. <laughs> I've got a bruised elbow where I crashed into the floor yesterday playing like I fell over. <laughs> entertaining my grandson. But I foresaw what they need. I didn't give them everything they wanted, but I did give them what they would need to succeed in life as best as I knew fit. Matthew 7, 11 says, if I then being evil know how to give good gifts to my children, how much more will your father in heaven? Good, good gifts to those who ask him, his children. How many of you feel robbed? Why are we robbed in our relationship with Jesus? In our fellowship with Jesus? When I became a child of God, God took me as his own. And I used to say this a lot when Joel was sitting here, my son. Because I heard this and I copied, I used it. So it wasn't originally for me. It's just, Joel is not where he's at today because of his dedication to his daddy. Because as many times as Joel was a little boy when I wore him out, he needed to write a correction. He would have abandoned his dad. He just couldn't see, you know. But his dad was committed to him. Understand what I'm saying, parents? I was committed to my son. See, God took me as his own, and he committed himself to me. There's been times when Daryl has been wayward. Guess who didn't forget my relationship? As I said before, you know, those of you who have seen The Sound of Music, we, didn't, we got adopted into the family of God, not the Van Trapp family. I won't go into detail. God, you didn't, it ain't like, well, you're doing great today, so you're a son. You're doing terrible today. Mm, you're outside the house. That never happens in, in this world, in, in tr real good parents, the way parents are supposed to be. You're not rejected one day, even if you're a sinning son. You may have discipline coming. Joel did many times. He never ceased to become my son, I, you know, to be my son. There's nights when I literally, ooh, I was on the verge of child abuse. There was. I've been tested. Those of you who have kids know what that's like. Sorry. Some of you have the testy ones, but I got on top of that. But anyway, but he never ceased to be my son. I was committed to him. God is committed to me. Philippians 1.6, and being confident of this, especially now looking back, that he who began a good work in me and in you will carry it on to completion, right? Till the day of Christ Jesus. Even though early on with him, my fellowship was very sporadic, not very consistent. One time Stan preached a message on, well, if you can't be consistent, at least be persistent. Way back there. When you remember, get back up. Sit time aside with God. And, you know, because I, I, this is what I was kind of doing, and I hope this is not wrong, but I'm going to launch out and do this. I'm going to mention just a few things that God, so examples of what God has done in my life, just out of my fellowship and becoming his son. Before I was really early, in, and, and some of this you guys heard before, so I'll make it through real quick. When I was early on, my parents ventured out into this relationship with God. I was a little boy who couldn't hear. Y'all have heard me say that before. I was deaf. I mean, at least I had to get right in your face. Dad took a new job, had to drop his insurance. He struggled with what to do. He stepped out and said, Lord, I'll trust you. One day, little Daryl's playing in the yard, and boom, I could hear everything. 
I ran into the house, told Mama. Mom put me against the wall and went over to the other side and dropped a pin. Ding! I have perfect hearing to this day. I can hear the sound they say that young, only young people can hear. I still hear it. You can play that sound. I can hear it. God healed me. When little Daryl was nine years old and jumped out of a truck, Mom and Dad taught me to just trust Jesus, trust Jesus. I didn't have enough reason to doubt. Daryl stepped on a snake. Y'all know that story? Sunk his fangs in and pulled, filled me with poison. I felt it. I felt it in my body. Mom turned around. I don't remember this. I, I still remember the fish. But I was taught not to fear. So they were flying to the hospital. I was still talking about the fish. And Mom said, are you scared? And my sister said, is he going to die? <laughs> and I said, no, I prayed to Jesus. Amen. Let me tell you about the fish. <laughs> and the, they kept me overnight. They put ice on me. They kept watching me and going, huh, that's God. But what about Daryl? Deb and I first married. I'm talking about God foresaw. God, and you all have these. Sometimes you need to go back and just start writing a list of things that God has done in your life so you can go, Lord, for, I forgot to thank you enough. And for those of you that's launching on this journey, look forward to the things that God is going to do. And if you've not depended upon God, or you've not really stepped into His family, receive Him. He'll teach you and instruct you in the way you should go. He'll start to do these things in your life. Deb and I were first getting married. Oh, I need a home, Lord. What to do? I need a home. I need a home. I can't afford anything. I was only making six dollars an hour as an electric electrician's apprentice. Lord, what am I doing? And one of Deb's aunts who had bought a little, a little home. Yeah. That's where Deb and I lived for three years. So one day we're laying in that little mobile home. Like I said, I'm real poor. And man, I got a little insurance check kickback. I'm like, all right. A little kickback, about $100. You know, back then, that's a lot of money. What are we going to do with her? I mean, Deb and I used to eat out once every three weeks, and that was Dairy Queen. <laughs> we were big time. A little $100 came in. I remember laying back on my bedroom floor, and psh, my head splashed. A little water heater went out. The Lord foresaw, and he gave that to you. You know what I'm saying? Did he make me rich? No. Did he start teaching me through things that I'm watching over you? They had electrical layoff in Texas. I got laid off, couldn't help it. It was a temporary layoff. Well, you hadn't been here long enough to draw unemployment, Daryl, so you're going to have to go back to your former employer. Well, my former employer paid me so much that the, the check that I got for my temporary unemployment was as much as I made as being an electrical apprentice. So God just... I mean, you know what I'm saying? It's just when you start to look back over your life. Um, I started a lawn care business when I moved here in 95. Man, I couldn't afford much. Lord, how am I going to start this, do this, have a place to live? Well, the guy that we knew out in Natural Dam said, Hey, Daryl, Debbie, have been looking for y'all. Uh, I've got a home in town. Would you just watch over it for about $50 a month until I figure out what I want to do with it? So we lived there three years for $50 a month while I built up my business. How many things do God just does and we forget to thank him about? Another time I'm laying there. Another time, check came in the mail. Hey, that's a $200 other insurance kickback. All right. $200. What am I going to do? My uncle passed away in Texas, and the family called up. I was the only one in the family even remotely close to being a minister. And they said, you're going to preach his funeral. I didn't have a suit. I took that, went to Penny's, bought me a black suit, went to Texas to preach a funeral. God foresaw. God's watching over. Did he make me rich? No. Did he answer everything? No. But did he cover what I needed? Yes. One time when Joel was, you know, I'm making more money, doing better. Joel needed a truck. I had a little 2000 Tundra. <laughs> but at the time, I just couldn't afford to get Joel a truck. I didn't want him to be, you know, I wanted my teenage boy to have a truck. I didn't know what to do. I go to work one day, and I'm just sitting here, and I'm going, Lord, I, you know, I can't afford a truck, another payment. And I go to work, I sit down, my boss says, hey, come in here. He said, uh, I've decided I'm going to buy some company trucks. Go find you one. I'm going to get you a company truck and you use it as your own. <laughs> so I gave Joel my truck and I had a company truck. Every youth, you know, Deb and I were youth leaders for a little over six years here. Every single summer we took our youth on a trip. And every single summer, the week before the trip, the entire wheels fell off everything. <laughs> everything. It didn't matter what it was, they fell apart. Right up to the last minute before we would leave, God brought it all together. Do you know what that teaches me? You know what it, it started doing? Well, we planned another trip, and I already knew. You know what's going on? Oh, you're just speaking into existence. No, I'm not. 
I knew the devil was going to come. I also knew that right at the end, God would make it work. You know what that happened every year till it's like? It didn't even surprise me. So you mean my faith was being strengthened by every trial I went through? Yeah. You know, the first time it happened, I'm like, oh, God, oh, God. The next time it happened, I'm like, not again. About the third time, said, you know, it's starting to make, about the fourth and fifth time it happened, I have a sword ready. <laughs> Go ahead and do what you want. It's God's promises are true. Amen. I'm taking them kids across the country. Megan's back there smiling. Megan and Josh, they were with me all those times. <laughs> uh, you know, when God re-rescued me, though, y'all, that's where my real story started. I began to keep in regular fellowship with Jesus. And I've been doing that since September 2012. You know, I'm not saying every single day. There's a day or few I miss it. When I miss a day, I miss it. I feel it. I've got to have fellowship with Jesus. You know, at one time, and most of you guys know this, and I, I'm going to share two more things, and I'm going to finish up my message, and we'll have the worship team come up. I'm just saying... This is a checkbook. What did Craig read earlier? Psalm 16. That's for the children of God. If you're a child of God, that is for you to quote and claim. How powerful is this word? Well, it's just words on a page. When the, when, when the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus, it drove him out into the desert to be tempted by the devil. And we all heard this before, but Jesus simply quoted Scripture. When we're faced with fears and trials and we wake up in the middle of the night, and I've done that many times. That's where you get out the word and you start claiming the promises of God because they're mine and they're for you and they're for every child of God, right? So at one point, I'm where I'm at today, building superintendent, overseeing construction, making a certain amount, doing great. God's covered lots of things in our life, but I had a lot of financial needs coming, a lot of financial burdens, things that were coming my way. Nobody knew about. My wife, no one knew about. And so Daryl's thinking, well, I, there's some empty lots in Van here, and I could build me some homes, maybe sell them. I could go back and pick up some lawn care on the side like I used to do, start mowing. But I thought, Lord, every time I've tried to work my own way out, I've created a disaster. So, Lord, I want to trust you this time. I, I, and I didn't have fear, maybe a little apprehension. But, I mean, as I'm approaching, y'all, there's some deadlines coming on some financial things. Deb had no clue. Daryl knew. But I, just something inside wasn't like I heard the Lord. But I just said, Lord, you right in here, you are faithful. And I want to trust you and not me. I don't want to come up with ways and means, Hudson Taylor said. I want to look to him who provides. Amen. And I want to prove your faithfulness. So a couple of weeks before some deadlines, my boss and I drive up to Northwest Arkansas. A lot of you guys heard this. Sorry if I'm repeating it. But we're sitting in the truck waiting on a state inspector to come in. And he looks over at me and he goes, how much do I pay you? Well, at that time, I used to, I was the office manager as well, so I used to write all the checks. And I said, you pay me this amount. He said, well, I'm going to give you a raise. And I said, why? He said, the Lord woke me and told me to give you a raise. And I said, wow. And he said, told me what to pay you. And he gave me a 50% raise which covered everything. I was, I was so excited. I said, can I tell my wife? He said, yeah, you can tell your wife. <laughs> Dev and I went and ate it. We went and ate at uh, 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 McAllister's. I remember now. We're sitting up on one of them tall tables. And I shared where we were. And she went, and then I shared what happened. And she started bawling. And everybody's looking down. Said, we're fine. We're fine. You know, she did. <laughs> but you know what? It's just these things like this that prove. And so the bit, another huge one for me, guys, you guys that have kids, Bethany knew that God was not calling her to immediately go to college. Bethany graduated in 2016. Everybody in school, listen, Beth withstood a lot of persecution in Damien High School. Because every kid going, what are you doing with your life, Bethany? If you're not got it set on college, you're wasting your life. Even Christian teachers, one that I'm having a hard time still today not going to. That's the, that's the dad in me. Deb's over shaking her head. <laughs> I could squash him. <laughs> no, in the spirit. <laughs> I heard a minister say one time, say, God, just let me be your assassin. <laughs> spiritually, spiritually. Okay. But no, 
But at that time, Bethany just knew, but she knew God had put a call for missions in her heart. We were having the perspectives in those days. I was just, I was talking to everybody, calling everybody what to do. Nowadays, if you look online at places to go, it's just a plethora. And which one, Lord, which one? And I had these direct, God was never concerned. God had a plan. Beth graduates. I had put together this plan with Doug Sarver, the, the, the missions pastor of Cross Church in North East Arkansas. went and had lunch with him, dinner with him. We talked. We had a plan that Bethany was going to go to him to Malawi, go with him and his team to Malawi for a couple of weeks. But that summer at uh, Jennifer and Colby Morgan's, their daughter's the one that's having the Amelia's 5K, which I encourage you guys, go out there. I'm out there. I'll be running this weekend. It's the last one. They raised all that money. Go out there to Greenwood. Let's fellowship together. Let's take the last one out with a bang. Show up, if nothing else. Fellowship. Cheer people on. And so you gave a girl that gave up all of her birthdays and took all the money and sent the money overseas. But we have a 4th of July gathering down there. Daryl's still going, oh, Lord, what am I going to do with my daughter? You need to put a call upon her life. So Sue Brucker, Sue's not here today, but Sue contacts a friend of hers, Barb Nietzsche, who runs the YWAM base in Ozark, Youth of the Mission, and Sue has her out there at Jennifer and Colby Morgan's. Bethany gets out there a couple hours before we do, and Bethany and Barb, you know, coincidentally just start talking. And Bethany started talking to Barb, before I ever, Dad ever got involved, because Dad probably would have stopped it, because you're not going to YWAM in Ozark. You're going somewhere big and important. But God had a plan. Beth comes and said, Dad, can I? I said, what? Yeah, I've been talking to this lady. I said, what's she doing here? How'd she get here? I don't know, Dad, but she. So end up, we go visit it, and we send Beth. And he used to tell, I used to tell my kids all the time this. I said, listen, you know, all those things that are, I'm looking around, all those things that are taboo between boys and girls that are dating are not between a man and a wife. God made it for your, your joy, keeps you together and keeps you in love. It's not taboo. I said, but God has a boy out there and a girl out there, and he's preparing them for you. And he's preparing you for them. And in his perfect time, he will bring that together. Don't mess it up in the meantime. <laughs> Beth got it. Beth listened to her daddy. Never dated a boy through high school. God sent her overseas for the guy that she was preparing She's sitting with, look, this is how God works. He's doing, Bethany goes. So their little YWAM base, you only get three months of teaching, and then they're going to do two months of outreach. They have two options. You can work with orphanages in China, or you can work with the refugees in Greece. But you all know, anybody that knows Bethany is going with the kids. But she said, Lord, I want to know. Well, she said, the teaching that day was on, you are light in the darkness. Well, okay, I want to be light in the darkness. She goes over to instructors, and she goes, which is the darkest place? And I said, the refugees. It's real dark with the refugees. And she said, okay, Lord, they're in a room praying. It's one of these drop ceilings like this. It has those two by two or four by two by four lay-in lights. Lord, do you want me to go to the dark place? The light went out over her head. <laughs> Only one in the room. She just said, Lord, that must be you confirming it. So she chose Greece. She goes to Greece. She's over there working with the refugees. And then she meets my son-in-law today, <laughs> Emmanuel. See, God had a plan all along that Daryl couldn't see. He foresaw down the road. And I, not that I'm not concerned, not that I don't pray for my kids, but God had a plan. See, she's his daughter before she's mine, right? So it's just things like that that just make me go, hmm, when is Daryl going to get it that God's got it under control? So let's liken all of this. Let's liken this getting in with Jesus' family. It's getting into a boat. There's just my notes. Like the disciples, when they get in, Jesus is the captain, right? We may sail into clear waters because we don't know what's coming. We may head into a storm. Some of you guys have been through much greater storms than I have. But God was with us the whole time. Remember, he is with, remember Peter. You know, I was thinking about this too. Step it out on the promises of God. At times I get real bold. And I read, like Craig says, in the morning, man, I'm up. I'm reading scriptures. I'm full of boldness. If Jesus says, get out of the boat, I'm out. <laughs> then the day comes and people go, did you prepare enough? Are you preparing about your, your retirement enough? 
what do you mean? Okay, God's okay, but you better get a plan. And all of a sudden, I start looking around, and I start thinking. Now I want to, we're fixing to sing a song here, worship team. I will put my trust in you alone. I will not be shaken. But you know, when Peter failed, we've all heard stories, Peter gave up faith. But Jesus picked, up, picked him up, he got it right in the boat with him. Man, when you mess up, when Joel messed up, as a little kid, when my kids messed up, I might have disciplined them. They were never outside my family. I was committed to them. God is committed to you. No matter how many lies the enemy tells you, you failed too many times, you missed your opportunities. That was the biggest one he used in my life. You know, there are most of these people you read about were young, and God used them. You know, they kind of masked your, past your prime. You're going to be one of them in the back, the back of the auditorium, the back of the bus, the back of the line. When Peter messed up, look how many, many, look how many times Peter messed up. And he was always one of the three that Jesus invited along. You know why? Because Peter enjoyed his fellowship with Jesus. He's always sticking his foot in his mouth. But he enjoyed his fellowship with Jesus. Jesus knows you can't do it on your own. And the enemy knows you can't do it on your own. All Jesus is asking of you, God the Father, have fellowship with Jesus. I'll take care of the rest. Your prayer life will increase when you see me and start fellowshipping with me. You'll realize how faithful I am. And you'll start to see my hand in things. When Jesus says you're going to the other side, you will get there regardless of the storms in between. When he told the disciples, get in the boat and go to the other side. Sometimes they encountered storms. Did he not know? Yes, he knew. We're going to make it through all the storms of life because the Bible, is pro Bible does not draw back when it talks about pain and suffering. We don't understand that. We just know that what God has begun and we get in with him, we're going to make it to the destination. No matter what we face. You're a child of God. The Bible is your checkbook. Cash the checks. Psalm 16. Read it. Trust it. Put it into practice. Here's another thing. It's like all those trials you used to face. Trials. You know, it's just things breaking down before youth trip. You know, God starts out trials little and builds up, right? You know why that King David faced lions and bears as he was a shepherd of the sheep? You know, the whole thing with David, his entire life was ordained and set up by God. He's watching over sheep with lions and bears coming. All they're preparing for much, much greater stuff. I believe, I truly believe this, that everything we're going through in life with our jobs and with our family and all this stuff, it's just trials for bigger stuff. If we can learn to handle the lion and the bear, the Goliath is nothing in our life. But also, here's another thing I thought about this morning. I go, you know, the lion and the bear prepares for the Goliath. But the lion and the bear in David's life prepared him for the Goliath entire, in front of the entire Israeli army. Man, sometimes God has you walking through stuff so you can step out and take care of the Goliath in somebody else's life. And then you'll look back on life and go, oh, Lord, forgive me for getting so upset because I'm going through so many trials and tribulations and temptations. It's like I was saying earlier. You know, I, there was one time when I was overseeing a big construction job. Everything was going wrong. At those days, back then, you guys that know, Angus Buck, in my, one of my spiritual heroes, was coming in town, and I was trying to set up the, the Harper Stadium over there for him to speak. And so uh, this pressure, pressure, pressure. What if nobody comes? And then my job was falling apart and just everything was going wrong. And in those days, I was so stressed. I was yelling at Debbie one day. She knew I wasn't yelling at her. I was about to pull my hair out. I said, I don't know what to do. Life was just overwhelming. None of y'all knew that. So I came in here on Sunday morning and sang and tried to believe. And then one day I'm walking out past that side that job. Bethany's in school at YWAM. Bethany's struggling, and Bethany calls her dad. Beth. You ever seen them old Wild West Western shows in the saloon where they're all fighting, and they all pile on that one guy, and all of a sudden he goes, Ooh. Yeah. You know what? When Bethany called her daddy, 
I mean, and listen, here's what the cool thing about it was. I learned from this. God began to pour into me everything she needed to hear is her dad. Every word she needed, I was prophetically speaking. I gave her words of knowledge, and I handled every situation. And when I got done and hung up the phone, I remember standing around going, where are all those demons that were harassing me? So here's what I realized. You know what? I've already been through lots of little foxes. <laughs> I won't say lions and bears, but <laughs> there's been foxes in the chicken houses. There's been a lot of things I've already dealt with. It go, you know what? I drew my sword and said, I got this. You're not touching my daughter. Things got serious. You know what I realized going? Man, I'm so thankful for the things I walked through. Man, if I can be the King David in somebody's life and take care of Goliath, I'm okay. I want to do that. How about you? Man, we're, all the stuff we're going through, it's already been, all these trials and tribulations, they're there so that our faith can be proved genuine. The Bible is this, we talk about the Bible is this checkbook. Guess what I've been doing lately? Do this. Trust me, do this. Look up promises of God. Google it. It'll come up 50 promises on faithfulness, 50 promises on goodness and hope and all that. Start reading them. You cannot help but get excited. There are checks you can cash as a believer. When, when God bring, when listen, when God brings you to a situation, he's wanting you to call upon him and his word. So that he can prove himself faithful. And you say, do you like winning that fight, Daryl? You like taking it? Uh-huh. You want to take on a bigger one? <laughs> okay, Lord, I'm ready. You know? And I, you know, not to brag, you know, one morning I'm sitting there praying. Man, I had a... <laughs> Pardon me. Usually I hit somebody standing next to me. <laughs> I can't help but get excited. I got a word for somebody. I thought it worked. Oh, man, I was all fired up. Couldn't wait to get to work. Time I got to work, <laughs> did I really hear? Was that just me? Man, that coffee was real good this morning. You know what? I just stepped out in faith. Y'all heard me say that. Stepped out in faith. Felt like an idiot. Went up and he couldn't sleep at night. Heard voices through the night. And I just laid hands on him and prayed out loud. And it was all ridiculous and left. Forgot about it and said, well, at least I was faithful, Lord. And about a week later, I saw him again. I said, hey, how you doing? He goes, oh. He started crying. He said, Daryl, that night I went home. No voices and I slept through the night. You know who was surprised? <laughs> Me. He thinks I'm a man of God. <laughs> Daryl's the one surprised. You know what? I, I took care of a Goliath in his life. Another time, him and his brother were suffering. I got around him that day and went home. Didn't pray. They went home. He was hurting real leg. His, bad, his leg was hurting real bad. Went home. And it was that night it quit hurting. You know what they associated that with? Being next to a man of God. That, but listen, guys, I know my weakness. I know I'm a jar of clay with more cracks than most of you. But also I know I'm a child of God. Amen. My God will not fail me. Amen. All right. I'm going to let the worship team come back up, and we're going to sing, I Will Build My Life. Because here's the thing about it. Some of us sing, you know, we sing the first song, All I Want Is You. Do you see my hands raised right there? It's a lie in a sense, but it was a prayer. Psalms 37, 4, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. That ain't delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you everything you want. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will make himself your delight. Yes. See, Alice Walton can make 52 million a day and get cancer. There's nothing you can do about it. Look what happened to Steve Jobs. What does the money do? But if you have faith in God, you know, the rich man tore down his barns and built bigger ones. And that night he died. And Jesus said, it was, so it will happen to all those who are not rich in God. But if you're rich in God, it doesn't matter what you face. It doesn't matter what you face. I thought I had something else. Oh, but we can sing this as a prayer. I will build, Lord, this year. Let me ingest more of your promises in your word. So that when 2025 comes, I'll be ready. Amen. I will build, as a prayer, I will build my life upon your love. It, I will prove it's a firm foundation. And I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken as a prayer and as a declaration. Amen.